Hi, I'm Laurel Griffith. Welcome to Sunday School. I'm so happy to be with you. We are beginning a new unit today and we will be discussing and reflecting for the next few weeks on the call of God. And so today we're talking about our call to salvation and our passage is going to be from 1 Corinthians. I want to give us a little context about the church in Corinth as we begin. Um, Paul founded this church on his second missionary journey um, and he came into the area and actually uh, as was his custom he would go to the synagogue first and then once they threw him out which usually happened uh, he would then find a, a place to with Gentiles to preach and so uh, he was active in the city and he received a vision from God who told him to remain in this city. And so Paul ended up staying in Corinth for 18 months, which is longer than he usually remained in any particular location. He found Priscilla and Aquila, and they were tent makers, and Paul was a tent maker, and they were Christians. And so he began to work with them, and they were a part of his ministry there. So he remains in the city for 18 months, and then he leaves and travels, and he ends up in Ephesus. Now. The interesting thing, well, let me, let me give us a little background on Corinth and then I'll tell you what's interesting about the letter to 1 Corinthians. Uh, Corinth is a, is a wealthy city. It's a city that's filled with a lot of business activity and tradesmen. Um, it is the, but the wealth, there's a disparity. There are a few people with a lot of power and a lot of money and a whole lot of people who are barely getting by. So that's kind of the climate of this city. It's a, there's a lot of activity in the city. There's a lot of trade in the city, a lot of people moving through Corinth. It, there is also the presence of idolatry everywhere. Uh, there is a temple to Aphrodite, which sits outside the city on a hill, kind of overlooking Corinth. And it was known that um, there were temple prostitutes that were associated with the worship there. And so Corinth was a highly sexualized place and it was, it was just everywhere. It was, it was accepted um, and even, um, even uh, encouraged in some ways. So the city is a blend of Jews, but primarily Greeks. There is a philosophy that is prevalent in this day uh, called dualism. And this philosophy is uh, that there was a um, division between matter and spirit. And so uh, anything that had to do with spirit was considered to be good and the spirit was what could be redeemed. And anything that had to do with matter was evil and matter could not be redeemed. So this was something that was being taught by Greek philosophers. Uh, eventually it would become full-blown Gnosticism, but it's not, it's not identified as that yet. It's going to be a, a while before that takes place, but the seeds of Gnosticism are present and you see this dualistic uh, idea uh, that is discussed and with Greek orators and philosophers and it was just a part of the culture, a part of the dialogue and it influenced behavior because uh, of course if matter is evil and it doesn't matter what you do, it's not, gonna, it's not going to have any uh, implications for your future then you behave any way you want to. That's called hedonism. And then the, the other extreme was uh, you're not going to focus on matter at all and only on the spiritual things. And so you disdain anything that is physical. That's asceticism. And both of those were prevalent within the culture. There was also this idea that philosophers would discuss, orators, uh, the rhetoric of the day, was uh, that you would achieve salvation uh, through wisdom, through uh, receiving more and increasing wisdom. And this wisdom was available only to certain people who were capable of receiving it, and those people just happened to be among the elite. So it was kind of like a ladder to salvation, but it wasn't through what you did as much as the, what you knew, the wisdom that you received. So that was the vocabulary that would be around in the culture. That was, would have been um, the Greek thought uh, that would have been uh, floating around along with the sexualized culture and all of this uh, disparity of income. And so you see all of that moving into the church as well. Now, Paul is writing 1 Corinthians, but we know that, well, he's in Ephesus, uh, it's a couple of years after he has founded the church in Corinth. 
But we know that 1 Corinthians is not the first letter that Paul writes to these people. And he refers to an earlier letter later on in the book. And in the first chapter of Corinthians, earlier verses than our focal passage, but you can read them if you'd like, you can see that there has been a rep some representatives that have come from Chloe. And Chloe seems to be uh, a person of influence in the Christian community there. Perhaps the church meets in her home, but representatives have come to find Paul and uh, in Ephesus and have given them a report about what is going on in Corinth. And it seems like this report is in response to the letter that Paul sent that we don't have. So they have reported, and this report, report is not good. It's concerning because there are all these problems. And the, what you see in society is actually what you're going to see as mentioned throughout the book of 1 Corinthians. We won't talk about all of them today, but these are the problems that show up throughout this book. There is a, a problem with sexual immorality in the church. There is a problem with a disparity between income and people who are affluent and wealthy and powerful uh, trying to assert their influence and call all the shots, um, and especially as it regards to the Lord's Supper. So there are these problems. The one that we see today that Paul addresses in the verses that is the, is the idea of the dualism of wisdom. So there is this discussion about what uh, true wisdom really is, and Paul is going to address it in our focal passage. So read with me, and we will begin with verse 18. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So here Paul divides the people into two groups, two groups of people in the world. There are those who are perishing and there are those who are being saved. And it all has to do with what you think about the cross. What do, how do you respond to the cross of Jesus Christ? Now, what you would find if you, uh, if you read what what Jews thought about the cross or what Greeks thought about crucifixion, you would find that both groups of these people, as different as they were from one another, <clears throat> they really had the same opinion about crucifixion. Uh, they were horrified by it. And the Jews uh, believed that to be crucified was actually to be cursed by God, that you would have had to do something really, really bad to be on a cross. And there's no way that God would have put his son or would have considered coming to the cross. That would be something that would have been totally uh, uh, wrong, something that would have indicated his own failure. And so it would, it would have been a contradiction of who he was to even be crucified. So the Jews had that view of the cross. Um, and then the Greeks had this idea that the cross was so horrific that nothing good nothing positive would be associated with the cross. So both of these groups of people see the cross as foolish. And because they see the cross as foolish, then each of these groups would be in the category of those who are perishing. Because what the apostle is saying is the people who are being saved are the ones who recognize the true beauty and significance of what Jesus Christ did for us, for all people, when he gave his life on the cross. And so the suffering of the Jesus on the cross for our sins is something that is the most beautiful and the most significant thing, and that is it's where we find our salvation. And so Paul here is setting this up and saying that this is, this is what matters, that, that people are divided. It is the dividing line. The dividing line is how you view the cross of Jesus Christ. So now let's look at verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. This is actually a quote from Isaiah chapter 29 verse 14. And um, in the prophet in Isaiah was saying that God would destroy the religious hypocrisy of the Jews. And so here Paul is pulling that out and saying that it is, it, it is hypocritical. It is, there is a hypocrisy associated with dismissing the cross. And God will thwart that. God will not bless that. God will condemn that. That those who do not value the cross, do not find their salvation in Jesus' death on the cross, will be perishing. Um, that the dividing line is there. The cross is the dividing line. 
Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? So the scribe would be a reference to the Jewish leader. The highest legal expert in, in Jewish life would have been a scribe. And then the debater would have been the highest Greek, uh, the orator, the one who had the most, uh, the, the best rhetoric, the one who would have been seen as being uh, the, the most uh, valuable in the society, the one with the most influence in the society. So Paul is calling out and saying, both Greeks and Jews, that, uh, that God's wisdom confounds them, that the orator and the scribe are foolish if they do not understand the plan of God's salvation in Jesus Christ's death on the cross. So no matter what the rest of the world says about you, no matter what title you might have or what prestige you might carry with you, unless you see the cross as being the way to salvation, then you would fall into that perishing group. You would be considered by God to be foolish. His wisdom would supersede your wisdom. For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The Jews demanded signs, and if you remember in the ministry of Jesus, there were Jews who wanted Jesus to do things, to prove that he was who he said he, he, he was. And of course, Jesus did do miracles, but it did, they didn't seem to matter. So Jesus knew that any time he tried to prove himself, it didn't have any kind of effect on these people. The Greeks are demanding uh, wisdom. The Jews are demanding signs. And in all of this, what God is saying is none of this matters. It is the wisdom of God. And it is the thing that is uh, the wisdom of God actually ends up uh, being the stumbling block to the Jews and to the Gentiles because if they can't get past the suffering Messiah who gave his life on the cross. But in truth, when they are called into salvation by God, if they receive Jesus Christ, they find out that the wisdom of God in Jesus Christ is their salvation and it is the beauty of their lives. It is the glory of God. It is, the, it is where God's plan and God's wisdom is revealed. And Paul is saying that he and others have been the ones who have proclaimed this truth. They have proclaimed this uh, this message of salvation through Jesus Christ to both Jews and to Gentiles. And God has called them to respond to this. So in other words, they're called out of the perishing category into the category of life and salvation. And it's what they decide to do with the cross that matters. It's whether or not they decide to, to submit to Jesus Christ, to surrender and to accept what the cross has done for them. So now he turns to their a personal experience. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Here the Apostle Paul is reminding them that they were called uh, and they were not wise by human standards. In other words, most of the people in the church who have responded to the uh, salvation in Jesus Christ have been people who don't have a lot of status. They are people who have not been seen as being particularly important by the world. But yet God's grace is for all people. Uh, God's message of hope in Jesus Christ, redemption through his bloodshed on the cross, is for all people. And the status does not matter. And when they come to Christ, they are actually experiencing the wisdom of God. Christ is the wisdom of God expressed. The wisdom of God is his plan of redemption 
that he has put into action he, before the foundation of the world that is, is here uh, seen uh, climactic in Jesus Christ. So Christ comes and brings the wisdom of God. He is the wisdom of God. He reveals the plan of God. And in this plan, there is redemption. In this plan, there is sanctification where we are made into the, to the image of God. We reflect the image of our Creator as the Spirit works within us. And all of this is the expression of God. All of this is made possible because of what Christ was willing to do for us when He gave His life on the cross. And so the cross is significant. The cross is what matters. And here Paul says, we don't boast in anything else. We don't take our security. We don't take our, uh, our status. We don't take uh, anything else in the world as, as reflecting on us that we would take credit for. We don't try to earn people's approval. The way we, we know ourselves, what we boast in, is we boast in what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, His Son. And when we are willing to do that, we actually are living in the wisdom of God. We receive the wisdom of God. Now, we need to make sure that we understand that Paul is not saying that we should not do our best to use our intellect and that we should not look at uh, academics or scholarship or any kind of learning uh, as insignificant. No, he, he's not saying that. What he's saying is that anything, though, that we attempt to know or learn or become, all of that has to be filtered through what God says. Everything has to be filtered through who God is, God's great plan of redemption, and what God reveals to us through His Word. And when we allow ourselves to be influenced by the world, then we are moving away from the message of salvation in Jesus Christ and the cross of Christ. And he's calling on the Corinthians. And I think for us and our the principle we could pull for into our own cultural context is the same thing for us. We don't wake up one day and decide to, um, to not love Jesus or to not believe in the cross. But what happens even for strong Christians, is we can set our eyes on things of the world. We can take our attention off Jesus. And when we take our attention off Jesus, the things in the world begin to matter more and more to us. And they become the things that we value. They become the things in which we orient our, our lives around. They become what is wisdom to us. And we begin to lose the focus on the cross of Christ. And it is only when we choose to focus on the cross of Christ that we are living in this relationship with God and allowing this connection with God then to overflow into our lives. So this is the apostles call to us is to remember that we have been called into relationship with God through Jesus Christ. This is how we are saved by his grace. And then as we live this out in our daily lives to continue to, re, to be reminded, to refocus our attention on who Jesus is and what he has done for us. So as we uh, go through this week together, let us reflect on what Jesus has done for us, what he has accomplished on our behalf, and let's recognize that we are all together at the foot of the cross, and let's be people who only boast in Jesus. Have a great week. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye.